pictures out of here. Oh, we can ready to ride across town. Okay, let's see. How to do the car? We are live. Time you got? Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right, brother. We're, we're we're live. So everybody, thanks for thank you for coming joining us again. Uh, I have Shake Sufi uh, on with us again. We were uh, disconnected uh, yesterday, had some technical difficulties, but we are back. And uh, Sheikh Sufi, you know, of course, I want to still build on Ibrahim Fall and the Bifal movement and Muradism, but I want to focus too on, I guess, the how Islam is African in origin and how it became, I guess, uh, I guess, associated with Arabism. Uh, I don't know if you know the history or the story about that on how you know how something that was considered African is now considered Arab. Yeah, I think. Um, hold on one no second. Problem. Can you hear? Can you hear? It? I hear you fine. I think what happened was um, just over. No, I think it was the media because. Uh, Islam has been in Africa forever, but the the, the Islamic movements in, in Africa never got any coverage. And the only thing that really got covered was uh, the Islamic movements in Arab countries. So the, the African Muslim was almost overlooked in a sense. Okay. But Islam has always been the hidden jewel in Africa. Okay. Let me ask you this. What, um, how did the uh moors i guess because a lot of people say they blame the moors or the northern black africans uh in regards to islam becoming arabic because they considered themselves arabic and not african or black uh is that is there any truth to that but what i know is that um islam spread through africa from sufis who traveled right across africa and when it came to, to West Africa, Islam was already in our nature and in our culture. So the West Africans accepted Islam because it was something that we already had in our practices. Okay. And, what, and one clear fact of that is that uh, in Wolof, the name for God is Yala. So they were already worshiping Yala in West Africa, in Senegal. Okay. Okay. So when it came with the name Allah, the people in West Africa, wait, that's who we've been worshiping all along. Okay. So let me ask you this. When I was in Senegal, okay, well, let me, let me back up for a minute. So when I was in Mali, uh, there was a clear difference between uh, their indigenous religion, which is animism and Islam. Uh, pretty much everywhere I've been on in West Africa where there's a heavy presence of Islam, they still acknowledge uh, an indigenous religion or animism or voodoo, whatever you want to call it. Uh, in Senegal, it's not like that. Like I asked somebody, some people like, what is your guys' indigenous religion? And they said to me, uh, Islam. I said, okay. Before Islam, did you guys practice voodoo or animism or any type of indigenous religion? And there was really no concept. And then I had to keep asking, and they were just kind of completely disconnected from any type of form and idea of indigenous religion. Uh, is there a reason for that? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, in, in Senegal, you have a very interesting phenomenon that didn't take place in a lot of the African countries. In Senegal, the indigenous African traditions were totally absorbed into Islam. Oh, so, oh, okay, okay, keep going. You have a guy in Senegal called a marabou. Right. And the marabou, he has the whole Quran memorized, but to be honest, he's practicing African magic as well. Please do, please do. Hey, brother, I was going to say, there's a lot of background noise. Uh, Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can turn the speaker off. I'm locking up. 
Oh, oh my bad. Hold on. I'm traveling a little. Yeah. Okay, is that better? Yeah, I mean, what, what I mean by background noise, it's just you can hear people talking in the background. But it, it, it's, it's better now. It's better now. Hello? Okay. Hello. Uh, is it possible? Do I, can I turn the speaker off? or? No, you're good now. You're fine now. It's just you can hear uh, people talking in the background. It was kind of yeah, yeah, that was uh, uh, the, the, the combo. But yeah, go ahead and go ahead and continue. But so, so in Senegal, the dynamic was the traditional African religions got absorbed into Islam, and so they don't separate the two. Okay. Yeah, I, th I, th I found that uh, I found that interesting, it, and it was to the point where, like, my friend I was talking to about that, he was kind of almost offended. Like, we don't practice that animism or voodoo. We have Islam. We don't need that. And I was like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, just everywhere else they uh, realize it, but okay. I apologize. Yeah, but in Senegal, they don't see it. I mean, like, especially the Sufi orders in Senegal, uh -huh. they got some stuff, you know, from Africa deep in our traditions, like making the talismans and doing the readings. All of that is pure African practices. But okay. you're not going to be able to separate from the practices of that in, in the Sufi orders in Senegal from Islam is so deep in the culture. Okay. So why don't, uh, again, uh, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, why don't, I guess, we'll say pale or Caucasian Arabs, why do they have issue an issue recognizing uh, Mordism or black Muslim or, or the Sufi movement in Senegal as Islam? I think because, uh, first of all, the Prophet Muhammad, he says in the Hadith, he said, um, four generations after me, Islam will be gone. So Prophet Muhammad lay salam, he says, four generations after me, Islam will be gone because he knew that the people in that region would not be able to carry the true traditions of Islam. Okay. All right, hold on. Assalamu alaikum. We'll see you, we'll see you get up with you at K's, right? No, at many. All right, go ahead. Yes, sir. So, um, I just found out the, the people in that region, what we call Arabs, they had a very, very ignorant past. They were not what we would call very intelligent people to where they even had a practice of burying young girls that were born because they mostly wanted to have male children. So that that race, that country or that region before Islam was very, very unintelligent. Okay. So when, when Islam came to that area, it was actually an age of enlightenment for the, the so-called Arab Peninsula. But you have to remember that back then, that was really East Africa. It wasn't what we call Saudi Arabia then. Okay. So, so but if you talk to, a, I guess, a uh, present-day Saudi Arabian or somebody in that peninsula or whatever you want to call it, and you tell them that this was once Africa and Africans were here, they will look at you crazy and probably call you a liar. Uh, how do you deal with that? I don't, I don't even deal with that. I mean, it's to the point now, and I'm sorry to cut you off, even in Egypt, Egypt is obviously in Africa, but you have Egypt, I think they consider themselves an Arab nation or part of Saudi Arabia, or they don't consider themselves African. I mean, and that's, that's for a lot of North Africans in general. I mean, how, what, what do we do to combat that or deal with that? Or See, my, my issue, that's not even my issue. My issue is how can I bring these teachings to the people in the West without having to get them involved in what we call politics? Uh, because uh, for me, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba is for us in the West and the so-called Arab people, they might not be open to his teaching just because he's from dark-skinned Africa. Mm -hmm. So I don't need, as, as my mother used to say, son, you got to choose your battles. That is an issue that somebody can deal with. But for me, I'm trying to see how I can take Sheikh Ahmed Obama to the hood. Right. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how, how, how can we take Sheikh Ahmed Obama to the hood? Whew. The best way is, like you said yesterday, to put his writings in English. Right. 
how to put his writings in English. And then um, I, I you with something so that take it to like I had I had a lot of success taking the Sheikh's teachings to different like um, neighborhoods or even like community centers, coffee shops. I went to a lot of different bookstores and gave lectures, and it's like people in America, especially the people who are Afrocentric in nature, when they find out that Sheikh Ahmed Obama is a holy man from black Africa, they with it. They're like, what? Nobody told me about him. And the fact that he was here less than 100 years ago makes him a very important figure in the consciousness of uh, people in America who are looking for spirituality. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, there are many that say that Islam destroyed <coughs> Africa uh, in the same manner that Christianity has done a number on, on Africa. Uh, what, what, what would be your response to that? My response is they always link Islam with the people, and the people in Islam are different. So uh, are we going to say that uh, Jeffrey Dahmer was a Christian, so the Christian people were all cannibals? Right. The people, they always make these blanket statements with Islam, but that was the individual who carried out those those acts. That was not Islam that did that. Correct. So, yeah, that's, that's the problem where the people want to paint a negative picture from Islam to keep people from coming to it, but Islam is actually the only thing that goes against the so-called capitalist society and the Western uh, mentality that I know of. So what? Let, let me, so let's talk about Sufism for a second. Okay. I read a book on Sufism written by a guy by the name of Idris Shah. Okay. Yeah. It's called the Way of the Sufi, and then he had another book I think just called Sufism. Right. And he said that Sufism, okay, is is you could be a, you could be a uh, Sufi and not be a Muslim. You have Sufi Christian, you have Sufi Muslims, you have Sufi. But for some reason, Sufism got attached to Islam. He said Sufism was around before Islam. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? That's a very good sales point to people who are non-Muslim to make them want to come to this path. But um, the, the principles of Sufism did exist before the Prophet Muhammad, like Islam. If you go to ancient Kemet, uh -huh. you will see pure, pure, what they taught in the ancient Egyptian mystery system is the exact same thing that we teach in the Sufi schools. So yes, the principles of Sufism did exist before the coming of the Prophet Muhammad <laughs> but for the total actualization of the Sufi practices, the foundation must be inside of Islam. Because it's almost like saying, I want to recite the Buddhist mantra, Om Mani Padme Hung, but I never studied any Buddhist scriptures. So Sufism is what we would call the fruit of Islam or the essence of Islam. I'll give you an example. Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba said Islam is like an egg. Okay. And Sheikh Ahmed Bamba said the outer shell of the egg is the outer uh, basic tenets of Islam that we call the Sharia. And he said that the uh, the yolk of the egg is what we call Sufism or Hakikat. So Sheikh Ahmed Obama said the yolk and the shell have to go together because the shell is what protects the yolk. So the basic practices of Sufism, the basic practices of Islam and the Sharia is what protects the higher stations of the Hakikat. And he said that without the, the yolk, uh, the egg would not have life. So it's Sufism that gives life to Islam but the basic practices of how to make a wudu, how to make salat, how to fashion Ramadan, all of these are what give uh, protection and safety to the practices of Sufism. Okay. Now, can you, let, let me ask you this. So in Mali, people still practice Christianity and they still practice their indigenous religion. People still practice Islam and they still practice their indigenous religion, animism. When I'm in Benin, people are still Muslim, people are still Christians, but they still practice their voodoo. 
Do you agree with that? Actually, yes, I do. Because, you know, power is power, and it's our definitions. We might call something good, or we might call something traditional hey, hey, African religion. Brother, I was I was saying we were losing you for a second. But we, start, we were losing you for a second. If you could um, let's repeat that, I'm sorry. I, I think what happens in the West is we put things in the it's okay to practice box and, and this is not okay to practice box. We got a lot of values from European who have no clue actually hey, they actually hey, was. Sheik, Sheik Shefi, Sufi, we're uh Sheik, we're, Sheik, we're, we're losing you. Uh, it's going in and out. Oh, let me turn it. Hold on, we're gonna stay by with a modifier or something. Hold on. Okay. Because that's a very important question. But I think that um we got a negative a negative viewpoint of the African spirituality from Europeans. Right. So in Islam, we have the concept la ilaha illallah, which means Allah is the only reality. So for for a Sufi, the universe is God, is Allah. So we don't see anybody practicing anything other than tapping into that universal that we call Allah in the natural uh, African traditions. But people on in the West, they look at it as, oh, that's African magic, or that's paganism or that's voodoo but in reality it was just a way of tapping into that one source that we call god using the forces of nature let's see we have a question in the chat room uh what let, let me ask you this uh what explain what africa was last lacking that islam afforded it Ah, we're, we're, <laughs> Shake Sufi, we can't hear you. Uh, uh, it's, we, we, we can't we can't hear you. It's, it's uh yeah, we can't hear you. All right, let me see if I can get to a place where they have Wi Fi. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah, it just it keeps going in and out. All right, let me get, hold on, give me a few minutes. I'm going to try to get to a place where I'm stationary. Okay, all right, cool. All right, everybody, thank you for coming on the chat. Uh, please like the video as you come in. Uh, you guys are being stingy with those likes. Again, if you're watching this video, please hit the like button. Please hit the share button. And please super chat. Uh, again, thank you guys so much for coming on. Um, and you know, once once the brother gets uh, stationary or in a better uh, location, you know, we'll go ahead and uh, and we'll continue. But I just want to thank uh, Sheikh Sufi for coming back on uh, and continuing the uh, conversation uh, that we had yesterday. That ended uh, because of technical difficulties. So, thank you so much for uh, for coming back on. Let's see here. All right, this can you hear? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. That's that's better. Go ahead. All right, all right. So, uh, what was the qu the question? Oh no, Africa was not lacking anything. And the practices of Islam are actually indigenous to Africa. People who study Islam, we know that um, in the Holy Quran, Allah says Islam is Deen al fitr which means Islam is the way of life based on the nature of the human being. So Islam was not anything foreign to Africa. Islam is actually the nature of the African. It's the nature of the human being but we see it as something different because we're not in tune with our own nature. Islam is the natural way of life. It's not a religion. Wow. Okay. 
But there are many that will tell you that Islam is a religion and they'll point to, OK, uh, you don't pray five times a day. You don't. <laughs> uh, you should eat pork. So what how do we separate the spiritual aspect of Islam for the religious aspect? Yeah, I think people have the wrong definition of religion and they have a wrong definition of Islam. From what I know, the word religion is nowhere in the Holy Quran. In the Holy Quran, you don't see the word religion. You see the word deen actually means way of life. So for people to call Islam a religion, that's like saying uh, Hinduism is a sport. They don't know what Islam is. The problem is we see Islam in the movies or in the media or we see um, Islam on TV and we think that that's Islam and that's not Islam. Islam is a way of life that you can learn from people who practice it. And if you talk to anybody who's really practicing Islam, they will tell you, no, this is not a religion. This is a way of life. Islam and Ma'at is the exact same thing. A lot of people don't know that. When you have the principles of Ma'at and the principles of balancing and harmony in the universe, Islam and Ma'at are the exact same thing. And nobody's going to come and say Ma'at is a religion. Right. Uh. Well, those are great points. Uh, let's see if we have any more questions in the chat room. Uh, okay. okay. What's, the, what's the difference between uh, African Islam and Arab Islam? <laughs> this is, I love this question. You know, I talked to a close friend of mine yesterday and they told me not to bash the Arabs because <laughs> I am the number one basher of them dumbass Arabs. Excuse my language. I, I know they probably uh, listen. Yeah. I had to say you, you can bash the Arabs on my platform. I have no issue with it. OK, so um, the difference between Islam and, 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 Arab and, and, and real quick, the reason why I say that is because I, I have an issue with the Arabs. They're very quiet on what's going on in Libya right now. You have Arab Muslims trading African Muslims and putting them into slavery. So you have yeah. the right to be vocal since they don't want to be vocal. Go ahead. Those are not Arabs, those are Persians. What I would say is the main difference is um, African Islam is more matriarchal. Where in African Islam, you see the woman in the forefront. And when you come to Arab Islam, it's more patriarchal where they try to put the man in the forefront. Right, women can't even drive. Yeah, but my teacher in West Africa, my sheikh told me the secret of Allah is inside of the woman. Wow. And the sheikh said in Tuba that it's easier for a woman to practice Sufism than for a man to practice Sufism because the nature of the woman is closer to Allah than the nature of the man. This is an African teaching. You would never hear an Arab person say that. In fact, I think it's to the point where Arabs are looking down on Moors because <coughs> I guess in uh, Arab Islam, women aren't allowed to make dicker. Is that correct? Or... Well, they do have some Arab Sufi orders where the women do come to the circles. Uh -huh. They do have Arab Sufi orders where there are women sheikhs in, in cer certain circles, uh, Sufi circles where the women may be a sheikh. But in uh -huh. West Africa, you see... Um, the promotion of women scholars where they have some Quranic schools in Senegal just for women. Okay. Even in Tuba, they have some Sufi schools or what we call a Dara in Tuba just for women. And people who study Islam will know that Islam was actually a women's rights movement where Prophet Muhammad came in that area and he gave rights to the women who didn't have rights in Saudi Arabia before he came. Okay. So let me ask you. So someone in the chat room just uh, said that uh, Islam, Christianity, and uh, Judaism are all Abrahamic, Abrahamic uh, religions, and all those religions are the same. What are your What are your thoughts on that? There's a story about uh, the elephant in the dark room. And it's kind of a long story, but basically, when you're dealing with Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they should all be saying the exact same thing. So anytime you see a difference, because I tell people, listen, 
the Jews and the Christians read the Bible, but they got two different religions. Right. Um, the Old Testament agrees 95% with the Holy Quran. The Old Testament does not agree with the New Testament, and the, and the New Testament does not agree with the Quran. So the problem in these three traditions is not the Old Testament or the Quran, it's the New Testament where uh, the false ideas of a trinity and the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit came into play that messed up the idea of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam having the same teaching. Mm. Did, that, did I answer you guys' question? Ten buck two. Uh, what about what we uh strange customs we discussed that uh already as far as what about traditional religion that came before islam uh, let's see here let's see if we got any more questions in the chat room let, let, let's do this let's get back to uh boredism Okay. Okay. And uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Afal. So the Bifal. All right. A lot of times people we get them confused with Rafa stories. Uh, <laughs> you, just to start just from the basics, can you explain the Bifal dress as far as the, the long dreads? Uh, it's hot as hell outside, but they're wearing a bunch of clothes, a lot of clothes. Can you explain the reason behind that? Yeah, by far, sick you refer, you know, for you and you won't fall, you need to get a sick you refer, but then sick you refer, something out of fall, you don't fall. The by far takes our way, myself, I'm a by far that practices Sharia. That's a whole nother story. Okay. So, um, sick you refer, the by far, we take our way, our mannerisms, our dab, and our character from what sick you refer did. Now, sick you refer was so concerned with the work. For Allah, he didn't pay attention to his hair. It's not like Sheikh Ibn Fall said, I'm going to grow locks. He just did not pay attention to his hair. Okay. It's not like Sheikh Ibn Fall said that I would wear patched clothing. He just did not pay attention to his clothes. Sheikh Ibn Fall would work so hard that his clothes would rip and he would just get another patch of he would take that's why the bifall clothes is multicolored. Right. Shake your falls clothes will rip, he'd take a green piece of cloth and throw it on there. The clothes will rip two months ago, two months later, he'd take a yellow piece of cloth and throw it on there. The clothes will rip three months later, he'd take a purple piece of cloth and throw it on there. So uh, today you have these multi-colored clothes and they're very beautiful, but that was not Shake Eva Falls. Uh, uh, idea to make a beautiful dress. His idea was whatever is here, I'm going to cut it and put it on my clothes to fix the rip. Got it. This is a totally different idea. He never said I'm going to grow dreadlocks. He just not, was not paying attention to his hair and it locked. Hold on. Somebody in the chat room said Buddhism is all folklore today. Be careful. Uh, can you address that please? Yes. I want to make it clear. My Sheikh, my beloved, Sheikh Ahmed Obama. Sheikh Ahmed Obama's teaching is pure Quran and Sunnah. You may see people in Senegal practicing something and calling it Mordism, and it's not exactly what Sheikh Ahmed Obama brought. I want to go on record and say that. I'm sorry. I love all the people in Senegal. I love all my Mord brothers. But if you read the if you read Masalik al Jinnan, check out Ahmed Bamba's book, or you read Makalik al Niran, or you read uh, Dawal Nafish, you read uh, his books on Iman, Islam, Islam, Mohammed al Kudus on Tahi, uh, Dawal Nafish on Fiqh. If you read Sheikh Ahmed Bamba's writings, he's teaching pure Quranic knowledge and pure Sunnah or Hadith of the Prophet. Now, what happens in Senegal is they take Sheikh Ahmed Bamba's teachings and put an African twist on it. And that's what happened to uh, any esoteric teaching will take the flavor of the country that it's in. 
So when people say Sheikh Abdul Bamba's teaching, Mordism is nothing but folklore, they never read one. Give me your email. I will send you a writing from Sheikh Abdul Bamba, and you will see that what he's teaching is pure Quran and Sunnah. You might see something in Senegal that is not that, but I'm here to tell you right now, Sheikh Abdul Bamba, he would say, my teaching came from the Holy Quran, and it came from Prophet Muhammad. So are you saying that we were not supposed to put the African twist on uh, Sheikh Abdul Bamba's teaching or on Mordism? No, nah, I'm not saying that because I love the African twist. You know, <laughs> I love the African twist. I'm going to have me some talismans, and I'm going to get me a reading if I think something's going on. Right, so, got you. Okay. I love the Africanness in it, but what I'm saying is the foundation is pure Quranic, and it is pure Sunnah. Okay. Yeah, the same guy. Uh, what's his name? Raw Aiden. He said, "Mama teaching has nothing to do with today's moralism." Now, I was in Africa. Let me tell you what my sheikh told me. Go ahead. My teacher. I mean, this is not to be taking offense to anybody in Senegal, because what we have in the Bifal movement and what we have in the moralism movement with the African flavor is the most beautiful system on the planet Earth. I, I want I, I to go on record and say. What we have is the most beautiful system with the African nuances and the African practices with Islam. But um, my teacher told me, Abdullah Farmi was my teacher. He taught me Sheikh Ahmed Obama's books directly. He gave me the teaching of Iman, Islam. Sheikh Ahmed Obama said, my way was founded by Iman and Islam, and it was made perfect by Islam. So for the people who are listening who might be Tijani, or I saw some people on your page who were Tukalor, uh, they do not know the pure teachings of Sheikh Ahmed Obama because they only see what the Moors are doing. But Sheikh Ahmed Obama says for the people listening who are in that group, my way is based on Iman, Islam, and Islam, period. So my teacher who taught me this was named Abdullah Farmi, Sheikh Abdullah Farmi. He got the books of Sheikh Ahmed Obama that we use for teaching the, the deen. Before Sheikh Abdullah Farmi began to teach me, and we were in Tuba, in Senegal. He told me, brother, before I teach you what Sheikh Abdul Bamba actually taught, I don't want you to get disappointed. Say that, Sheikh. He said, because what the people are doing in Senegal is not exactly what Sheikh Abdul Bamba taught. He made that clear to me. So as we went through the books, uh, there are some things that I learned in Senegal that I don't teach people. Let me just go. There's some things that I know that I might practice myself, but I don't teach it to people because I want to teach people what Sheikh Abdul Bamba brought in his books. I think it'll be a disservice in certain instances to teach people everything that I learned in Africa when I could just teach what I got from Sheikh Abdul Bamba directly and give a pure, a pure representation of what Sheikh Abdul Bamba brought. Okay. <coughs> he says, "I hope that answered the question." Uh, yeah, this guy, he's uh, we have somebody who uh, strongly disagrees with you, but uh, let's. Uh, That's good. I love it. Okay. I'm ha I'm happy that they don't disagree. That's very good. Okay, he says that they promise you heaven if you if you're willing to make them rich. So I guess he's talking about the marabouts. If you promise to make them rich and give you heaven. Is that, is that true? Listen, hold up, listen, listen. That ain't got nothing to do with the bayat. The Prophet Muhammad said, anyone who says la ilaha illallah one time is going to Jannah. So they try to bring up some BS about the bayat with Sheikh Abdul Bamba, and they forget what Prophet Muhammad said to the person listening. You know and I know our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, anyone who says la ilaha illallah one time with sincerity is going to Jannah. So don't bring that issue up, Mr. Muslim. You know Prophet Muhammad said that. So it's not about, oh, if you take the bayat with Sheikh Abdul Bamba, you go to Jannah. Before the bayat, if you said la ilaha illallah one time with your heart, you're going to heaven. So that's not an issue. Okay. Lola Love says it's a disturbance for us to even be using Arabic to speak on stuff we already had in our own, in our ancient traditions. How do you feel about Arabic? Is Arabic uh, an indigenous language in Africa? That an African language? Uh, as I said before, it was only called Saudi Arabia less than 400 years ago. And when Prophet Muhammad was there, that was East Africa. Now, 
Now, when we deal with spirituality, honestly, Moralism is the science of God realization. Moralism, what Sheikh Ahmed Obama teaches, is the science of drawing close to the oneness of Allah. And when you deal with Allah, you're dealing with energy and vibration. So the prayers in Arabic have a higher vibration than the prayers in other languages. I'm just talking about a scientific fact of the vibration. You can say in the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, or you can say Bismillah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Anyone listening to that, you can say there's only one God, or you can say La Ilaha Illallah. So when you're praying in Arabic, you're actually raising your vibration. And this is what we call the science of uh, Tasawuf, or the science of raising your vibration to a higher vibration to bring you closer to the proximity of Allah through the Arabic prayers. Okay. Yeah, the the, the guy who's uh, disagree with you, he said that uh, he was born a Morid and uh, he, he disagrees with what you're saying, but it, that, that's that's whatever. Uh, now, someone in the chat room asked, I think we already spoke on this. Uh, he says that, what do you think about my ancestors' religion, voodoo? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, think no, I think nobody knows what voodoo is except for the people who practice it. People looking on the outside of voodoo, they don't know what it is. The only people who know what voodoo is is the people who practice it. That's what I'm going to say on that point. Okay. Yeah, but I know some people who practice it, and it's not what people think it is. Oh, I already know. I'm, I'm headed to the Voodoo Festival next week. I've been covering Voodoo as well. So, uh, and, and and that's where I'm torn, brother. I love the shake. You know, I love Mormonism. I love Islam, but I just cannot compromise myself in my, I guess, indigenous African religion. No, and I think that's what makes Sheikh Ahmed Obama so beautiful is that you have uh, the African tradition practiced quite well with Islam, and it's very beautiful. I'm not going to take my talismans off. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm going to keep taking me some Quranic spiritual baths. I'm sorry. Right. So the tradition, when you put it together, it's like they say in the West, the Shaolin and the Wu-Tang could be dangerous. Right. <laughs> so it's a beautiful system when you have Islam with the African tradition. The Shaolin and the Wu Tang could be dangerous. All right. So someone in the chat room said that uh, Islam is a Hebrew religion, and that Prophet Muhammad even wanted to be recognized by the Hebrews as a prophet. They rejected him, and that's why he switched the Muslim holy day from Saturday to Friday. What are your thoughts on that? Totally false. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> totally false. Next question. I mean, whoever has that idea, may 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 Yah, may Yahweh, may Jehovah bless you in your efforts. But you're reading some misinformation from people who had no idea who Prophet Muhammad was. You know, I don't want to take it lightly. I mean, whoever said that is probably have a pure heart and pure intentions, but what they said is totally false, and I want to go on record to say that. Okay. Okay, he says, uh, we sh Leo says, we should not have to beg people to be, be African. If they, want, if they don't want to be or claim it, good on them. We have those brands. How do you feel about that? I agree with that. Now that I agree with 100%. Uh -huh. If somebody doesn't want to be African, that's on them. But I had a talk yesterday with my daughter because she has a friend from Nigeria who's trying to tell my daughter, who's a senior in high school, that my daughter is not African and I'm African because I'm born in Nigeria. And I told my daughter, if we go in this Chinese store right here and buy some shrimp fried rice and we ask the guy who ain't never been to China, his father ain't never been to China, if we ask him who are you, he's going to say he's Chinese. Right. That man from China might be a fifth generation China man in America who five generations ago was in China, but he ain't gonna never say he's American. He's gonna say he's Chinese. So the African born in America is African. I don't care how many generations it takes you to get back to Africa, but you are an African that just happened to be born here. And he's right. We don't have to beg people to, to accept Africa and be African. Mm. Absolutely. Let's see what other questions we got in the chat room. Uh, all right. So Lola said, "What about Islam's ban on ritual magic?" 
is that a misinterpretation as well? Islam's what? Islam's ban on sorcery. What are your thoughts on that? Is that uh, the Africans in Islam ain't ban no sorcery. <laughs> Islam's ban on sorcery does not exist in Africa, my friend. Okay, what about it? Is it in the Quran at all? In the Quran, there were two angels that came down. I'm not going to go into it, but in the Quran, there were two angels that came who taught magic. That's right in the Quran. So the, the idea, and they put magic on Prophet Muhammad when he was here. So magic has been here forever. In the Holy Quran, there's two angels that came that taught magic, but the problem in the crime was they said that they taught this magic for the division of families. So yes, in Islam, uh, you will hear teachings of uh, of magic or sorcery, and it's right in the Holy Quran. Even in the Prophet Muhammad's life, there was some Jews who put a spell on him, and the angels had to come and tell him how to remove the spell using the uh, last three surahs of the Holy Quran to break the magic. All right, Wild Hiatus says, how can one follow religion while speaking science? The text clearly forbids this. What's your, what's your... Uh, uh, how can one follow religion while what? Speaking science. The text... Speaking science. Yeah, the text clearly forbids this. No. No, that's not true. There's a book called The Bible, The Quran, and Science. Uh, this person, if they read the book called the Bible, the Quran, and Science, they will see how the Holy Quran matches up with science. The Quran is a very scientific book. And our practices are science. What Sheikh Abdu'l-Bamba is teaching is actually science of the soul. Let me cut you off real quick. Didn't the first, uh, did, when the Moors or the Muslims went into Spain or Southern Europe, didn't they teach science and math? Yes, the, we were the ones who brought the Europeans out of the Dark Ages. Right. Yeah. So, uh, what we practice with Sheikh Abdullah can be proven in a science lab because it's a science of the soul and the purification of the soul. The whole Sufi path is what we call in Arabic Taskil to Nafs. Taskil to Nafs is the purification of the soul, and it goes through what we call Tarbiya, Tarki, and Tasbiya. Uh, Tarbiya, Tarki, and Tasfiya are three levels of purification of the soul that we learn in the school of Sheikh Ahmed Obama, and it's a scientific practice that can be duplicated even on the moon if you knew these teachings. Wow. All right, so, uh, so magic in Islam is okay? In Africa, yes. In Arabia, in Saudi Arabia, no. Okay, there we go. Okay, Jermaine Woods wants to know why is the holy day on Sabbath on Friday uh, and not Saturday? Uh, to be honest, every day is holy, and it really doesn't matter which day you pick to celebrate it. That's just something people use to divide and conquer. Every day is holy, my friend. Monday is holy, Tuesday is holy, Wednesday is holy, Sa every day is holy, but there were certain things that happened on Friday that gave it a certain uh, special particularity amongst the days of the week. The prophet Adam, peace be upon him, came to earth on a Friday. Um, the day of judgment will be on a Friday. The day of resurrection will be on a Friday. There's a list of things that happen on Friday in history and that will happen in the future that give Friday certain precedence over other days. But in reality, every day is holy. Okay, let's see here. Um, Someone in the chat room says, uh, black people will embrace anything that's not African. Abrahamic religions are not for black people or never were. What, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Abraham was black and all the prophets were black. Whoever says that, they didn't study the history of Abraham. There's a story about Moses in the Bible. Moses says that he put his hand into his garment and it came out white. And then Moses says he put his hand back in it to his garment and it changed back to its original color. So what was the original color of Moses' hand? And this is in the Bible. All right, they said that Abraham and Sarah were Amorites and Hittites. You know, I'm not gonna deal with that because uh, a lot of these definitions that people get, 
we don't know if it's true or false, but I do know that all the prophets had melanin. That okay. I do know. I don't. I don't care. There was never a prophet who came who did not have melanin. Okay. Uh, someone asked, "Is Bob, is Sheikh Amadou Obama going to intercede on Judgment Day?" Not only that, but in the Holy Quran, there's a verse that says, uh, "Only those who will intercede who have the power to do so." That's an ayat al kursi. Anybody who has a question about somebody interceding on judgment, you should read in the Holy Quran where Allah says, "Allahu la ilaha illallahu alayhi wa sallam la taqulu sinna tumala no mahu mafi samawati mafi art." is Arabic for saying the one who will be able to intercede is the one who has permission from Allah. It's in verse 255 of the Holy Quran called Ayat the Kursi, and all of the Muslims know this verse. So the fact that Sheikh Abdul Bama interceding on a is another verse in the Quran that says you will be called on the day of judgment with the Imam that you were following. So intercession for someone who has Quranic knowledge is not an issue. And Prophet Muhammad says, he who dies without accepting an imam or a teacher will die in a state of jahiliyyah ignorance. So it will behoove you to find a teacher like Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, Sheikh Ahmed Tijan Sharif, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Zalani, uh, Sheikh Abu Hassan Sadli, all of these Wali's friends of Allah, will definitely intercede for their followers on Yom Kiyama. This is a fact. Okay. Uh, someone else had a question. Let's see here. Uh, from Goriga said, if you are black, your original religion is voodoo. Uh, and then Roderick Lassen wants to know, which Quran should someone read? Like, which version? Wow, you know, the one thing I love about the Holy Quran is every translation is close to the Arabic. You won't find a Quran that's too far off from the Arabic because honestly, the Muslims are crazy. Muslims are crazy. If right. you translate the Quran and you change something in there, they're going to kill you. I'm right. just saying. The, 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 the Muslims, if you translate the Quran and it's not close to what it's saying in the Arabic, them Muslims going to knock on your door and you're going to be dead. So any Quran that you read is pretty close to the Arabic. So it doesn't really matter which one you read. My favorite one that I read was by... Uh, Brother, we just lost you. Muhammad picked all translation because it didn't have any commentary in it. Brother, if you if you could repeat that one more time, because we, we lost you for a second. Which which version is your favorite? My favorite translation is what you call uh, uh, the Muhammad Piktal translation, which was uh, it doesn't have any um, Muhammad Piktals does not have any commentary in it. The commentary is where the translator will put his own two cents in in the in the meanings of the verses, but in Piktal, Muhammad Piktal's version, there's no translation, no um, commentary. But then uh, our teacher, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he recommended the Maulana Muhammad version, and Maulana Muhammad was a Sufi, so in Maulana Muhammad's commentary on the Quran, you will see some Sufiistic ideas in the commentary. Okay. Let's see here. Let's see if we got any more questions in the chat room. Uh, uh, let's see here. What are your uh, so as far as, as we start to modernize? I mean, what role will Muradism and the Biafra movement play in the modernization of uh, Africa or of Senegal? One thing I want to say is that. Uh, before Sheikh Ahmed Obama came to Senegal, the Senegalese people had an inferiority complex for Arab Muslims. That's a fact. Hey, bro, hey, bro, I'm going to say this. Some of them still do. <laughs> and, and, and think about it. It's not just limited to Senegalese Muslims. I think African Muslims in general, except for um, maybe the Nation of Islam, and I'm not saying all Moors, a lot of them still have an inferiority in, in, uh, they still have some kind of inferiority complex when it comes to Arab Muslims. Yeah, so when Sheikh Ahmed Obama came to Senegal, he removed the inferiority complex of the Africans for the Arab sheikhs to where 
even the Arab scholars in Mauritania became disciples of Sheikh Ahmed Bamba. Right. You can go on YouTube today and see Arab scholars in Mauritania giving praise and laudations to Sheikh Ahmed Bamba. You can well, look come, that up on YouTube well, and find those videos. Yeah, well, they, so, come, Sheikh, uh, they come to the Grand Mogul every year. But go ahead. There's yeah. a lot of delegation that comes from Mauritania every year to the uh, Grand Mogul. That's facts. That's facts. So Sheikh Ahmed Bamba was a unifier of nations and tribes and communities under the banner of La Ilaha Illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. When they asked Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, who was with you? Sheikh Ahmed Bamba said, anybody who says La Ilaha Illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah is with me. As we go forward in this century going into 2019, you will not find a better example of a teacher or a role model for uh, Islamic spiritual um, movement other than Sheikh Ahmed Bamba coming from West Africa. Sheikh Ahmed Bamba has a complete system for transformation of the human being and for the perfecting of the character. And when you put what Sheikh Ahmed Bamba is teaching with the work ethic of the Bifal, you have a perfect system. Okay. Let's see here. Any more questions? Uh, someone in the chat room says Sufism and politicians wrecked Senegal. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, my Sheikh Serene Salihu, when he was the Khalifa in Tuba, he told people do not even talk about politics. <laughs> so our order is against politics. Sheikh Ahmed Bamba is not about politics. The Khalifas in Tuba are sovereign. They are not about politics. Well, the thing is, now, Tuba is somewhat like the Vatican, where it's his own sovereign nation, correct? Somewhat. That, that is, man, you hit it on the head. Tuba is a sovereign nation inside of a nation. Right. So our shape, the city of Tuba, is under one. I'm not going to give all the specifics online because everybody doesn't need to know that. But uh, Tuba is definitely an independent nation inside of a nation. So we have a government inside of a government, whereas... Even the police in Senegal cannot go into Tuba unless they have permission from the Khalifa. Right. So, yes, we are a sovereign nation inside of a nation. And, and, and brother, this will be the last question. Um, how did Islam help liberate Africa from oppression? I think in the Holy Quran, there are verses that say... Uh, how the virtues of freeing a slave islam is anti-slavery islam is freedom so islam itself is a is a freedom movement you can say islam is revolution against the colonial against colonialization and islam is freedom for anybody who practices it okay all right hey, everybody in the chat room thank you so much for coming on i really appreciate it sheikh sufi thank you for coming on uh, Sheikh Sufi, I'll let you have the last word. Uh, you can close out. Also, share your contact information with everybody so they want to reach out to you and continue the combo. And also, you'll be back on here as well. You know, don't be a stranger. But, oh, yeah. We're going to do this work together. And uh, it's amazing that you're in Atlanta, and I just moved to Atlanta in October and had no idea that there was a brother there promoting the teachings of Sheikh Ahmed Bamba. Oh, absolutely. So, so we definitely got to... We definitely got to get up. We we can eat. We can grab something to eat at uh. There's Bamba Cafe on uh Campbellton Road. There's they uh, got a Bamba Cafe in Atlanta. Yes. Man, you got to. I don't know nothing about these spots. Oh man, well listen. I'm I'm gonna email you my phone number and we'll go grab something to eat. I know where all the city gas Senegalese and Gambian spots here are in Atlanta. Oh, we got we got to go. I know most of my friends in Atlanta are vegetarian, so they're gonna be hating on me oh, for going to the restaurant. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're missing out on that good African food. So I don't know, but let me get my contact. My contact is uh shakesoupy at gmail dot com. C H E I K H S U F I at gmail dot com. C H E I K H S U F I at gmail dot com. Also, I have a Shake Soupy uh, channel on YouTube, Shake Soupy channel on YouTube. And if you want to get some writings on Soupyism and Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, I have a blog in the 786soupywisdom.com. 786soupywisdom.com for the blog. And Brother Dynast, Amir, it's a, it's a beautiful, uh, to see somebody promoting Sheikh Ahmed Bamba just makes me smile. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, listen, I wouldn't care if you was an alien with three titties, I'd be with you. <laughs> Let me just say that. Hey, no, no total recall. This is not a, a order. Arnold Schwarzenegger field. No total recall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brother. But uh, everybody who's on the um, who's on the chat, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, make sure you guys go to search for Huru on Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, go to search for Huru dot com. Go to uh, Amazon dot com. Put your name Dinah Samir, and also go to Dinah dot com as well. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I might be back on later on tonight. If not, you guys enjoy your New Year's Eve. Shake Sufi, you be safe out there. Uh, and when you get back to Atlanta, hit me up. Let's go grab some uh, some Cheb, some Cheb, some Chebu Jim, Chebu Cheb Yap. Uh, Most definitely. Uh, peanut butter stew. I, I, I got you. Most definitely. Shake it with a fall to the death. All right, to the death. Bye bye. Peace. <laughs>